Hey guys, welcome to the Mr. Maple Show. I'm Matt. And I'm Tim. We greatly appreciate you watching today's video. And this is part two of a series that we've got on grafting. You know, this is something people always come to us and ask daily on how do I graft a Japanese maple? We're covering that. We've already done part one. Go check out that video first. This is important that we're talking about in part two, but if you hadn't seen part one and done part one, part two doesn't matter. You gotta make sure you do part one first. We have the ABCs of grafting Japanese maples. Yeah, so today we're gonna to be doing the B part. Now the B part of the ABCs of Japanese maple propagation is blades in motion. Now this is the part everybody focuses on, but the A and the C are actually the most important part. I always like to stress that. Today we're gonna to go over a little bit of the physical motions of grafting, how we do it, and kind of give you some of the basic tips for good success on grafting Japanese maples. We're gonna talk about being safe, being clean, cutting the sign wood, cutting the understock, lining up the can bin, and tying off the graft. I'm here in Matt's yard, and I'm standing beside Acer Shirasolinum Red Dawn. This is a tree that has amazing, amazing fall color. This cultivar is the one that we're gonna be showing how to select the best sign wood. Now, Acer Shirasolinum Red Dawn, this is a really cool Japanese maple. It's a hybrid Shirasolinum, and the fall color is just electric. It lights up the garden here in the fall, and we really love these characteristics that this cultivar has. And since we're gonna be producing this selection, we're looking here at the new growth. Now the new growth is what we want to take our cuttings from. This is the last year's growth that is one solid strand. Often when Japanese maples grow, they'll grow once during the spring and then they'll grow again during the summer. What we want is that most recent growth. And that's gonna be the growth that heals the quickest. You can actually graft some of this older wood, some of this twiggier wood down here, but you're not gonna have as good a success as if you're grafting up here with this fresher new growth. And one of the reasons is that older growth is just slower to heal, where this newer growth will heal much faster, giving you a better success when it comes to grafting. One thing to consider when you're collecting the signwood out here in the open is you always wanna look for the branches that are extremely healthy. If the tree isn't very healthy, you may be selecting from a tree that is very sickly and you may actually produce a sickly plant when you graft it. So you always wanna produce from healthy plants that look beautiful and that's gonna be the characteristics that you're likely gonna be propagating when you're doing this grafting. Now, one thing that may happen sometimes with trees that are outside like this Red Dawn is the late frost may come in in the late fall and damage some of these buds. So whenever you're looking, you're gonna to wanna to look for healthy buds and healthy limbs that you're gonna be grafting from. Now again, we're gonna be collecting signwood from this new growth up here. So this longer strands up here are gonna be what we'll be collecting signwood from. And you see here, this is one continuous growth. This is from the last year's growth. And this is gonna make the very best sign wood. Now we'll get more into the specifics of what we wanna cut when we're cutting uh, the, dif the different varieties. We wanna look at, you know, two nodes sometimes if you're gonna be going in and grafting something real rare. Sometimes you can do one set of buds or one set of nodes. But sign wood selection is critical when it comes to this. And the main thing is you wanna have healthy plants. Out in the landscape is great. Ones in containers are fantastic as well. You know, our one gallons at Mr. Maple actually produce some of the best scions. A large plant like this doesn't produce as much uh, fresh new growth as say a one or a three gallon. Sometimes a one or a three gallon, you can produce a whole lot of different trees off of the fresh new growth because there's more new growth from that previous season. So as we're looking here on this last year's new growth, We've got some different size scions that we could select. This one here, probably a little small. You can graft it, but it's not really recommended. This here, this is graftable, but I like to graft this size right here. When I'm cutting the sign wood, I like to cut it right above one set of buds. That way on this next growth, this will actually grow out from this point right here and create new branches. But right here, I've got a great piece of sign wood that I can graft and this is a great way of getting the right size scion and something that you can use. You know, this one's a little bit thicker. It's a little easier to graft and line up the cambium on something this size. Now, whenever you've got your pruners, you wanna make sure that these things, you clean them. If you're going around cutting a lot of different trees, what you can actually do is if you've got something bad on this, you can transmit it from one tree to the others. So it's important to grab some rubbing alcohol and clean your pruners between plants. That's what I'll be doing next is cleaning these pruners and you know, I hope you've enjoyed understanding exactly what sign wood is and the best way to prune it.
So now we've collected our sign wood and timing is of the essence. You don't want your sign wood to sit around for a long time. You want to graft it pretty regularly. I tend to get to it the very next day if possible. I have stored stuff up to a month, but sometimes the longer you wait with certain sign wood, it's going to break down. It's basically going to deteriorate quicker. So you want to get to this pretty quickly while it's live and it's got a lot of healthy you know, energy still going on in there. So it matches up quickly with that rootstock. Now, the reason we graft is to lock in specific traits for a cultivar. Now, a cultivar is a plant that's been cultivated for those specific traits. So think of it like a breed of dog. You want to be continuing on those specific traits that are in this Red Dawn. So we're going to make a basic clone of this. Now, there's so many different cultivars of Japanese maple, so it's very important at this stage to label your sawnwood correctly, to get everything as accurate as you can, because, you know, the importance is on you to produce the right names going forward. So if you're going to be grafting this, it's very important that you'll, you'll take your time and get that stage right because you can get it wrong for a lot of people going forward. So the propagator has, you know, they have to do their due diligence and their nomenclature and make sure everything's labeled correctly because propagating plants under the wrong name doesn't help. Now you want to be able to, to identify the differences here between uh, the different cultivars, just like you would different breeds of dogs. So you wouldn't want a Great Dane, breed one a Chihuahua, and the same could be said if you're wanting a lace leaf, you know, Red Dawn might not be the right selection for you if you're looking for a small weeping lace leaf. And that's exactly why we graft, to continue on the diversity of these unique traits. Now, Japanese maples can be done as rooted cuttings, but they don't make as quality of a plant. One of the reasons we graft is because we're putting on a healthy root system. We're making it the best possible tree. A grafted Japanese maple should live to be over 100 years old, where rooted cuttings can often pick up ground-borne pathogens and not have as long of life or as much vigor to them. Now certainly rooted cuttings can be done. We've done thousands of them here at our nursery and they work great for container culture or for bonsai. But I don't recommend them for landscape trees simply because they're way more likely to pick up you know, diseases and they kind of make wonkier shapes long term where a grafted tree is going to have a healthier set of roots and make a much more premium Japanese maple in the landscape. Another reason we graft is that Japanese maples don't come true from seed. So with seedling Japanese maples, there can be a great deal of variability. I actually collected a lot of seed off this Red Dawn last fall, and a certain percentage of those seedlings will look like the parent plant, but some will look completely different. There's so much going on in those genetics. Tim and I often use ourselves as an example, and we'll say, hey, we're brothers, but we don't look exactly alike. And the same can be said of siblings from Japanese maples. Some are going to give you what you're looking for, that desired trait that's replicating Red Dawn, but some might be a dwarf, a compact form or even a weeping form. So to lock in those exact traits, a graft is the best way to propagate Japanese maples. Hey guys, today we're gonna to talk about safety first. This is paramount when it comes to grafting. You know, if you graft, you're gonna get cut. It's just a matter of time. And we're gonna talk about some safety tips here before we get started, because today we're grafting. We've got knives, we've got things that can actually cut you. And I've seen a fair number of people cut themselves when they're grafting. I've done it myself. And if you do enough grafts, you're gonna get cut. So let's talk about a few things first. When you drop a, a grafting knife, it's sharp, don't grab at it. You're gonna end up uh, cutting your hand. Just let it hit the ground, then pick it back up. You don't also wanna to try to grab it with your legs. Sometimes people will drop something, they'll catch it with their legs. You can stab yourself in the leg. So be extra careful with this. You always wanna make sure that you're paying attention to what you're doing. You wanna focus on grafting when you're grafting and you, don't want, you always want to make sure where your fingers are at. Keep an eye out where your fingers are at and keep them in safe locations so they're not going to get cut. It, it's really important. Now, when we're doing this, we want to make sure that our knives are extremely sharp. And there's plenty of videos you can go online and learn about how to sharpen your knives. A grafting knife is only sharp on one side and you want to make sure that it is extremely sharp. A dull knife is going to cut you. Whenever you have a sharp knife, you're going to make the cleanest cuts and it's gonna be the safest for you. Now, the other thing is, is you don't wanna make deep cuts. A lot of beginning grafters go in and make deep cuts into the rootstock. One, it's gonna fail. The deeper you cut, the longer it's gonna take for that plant to heal. Two, if you're making those deep cuts, you're likely gonna cut through the rootstock and cut your hands on the backside. So making thin cuts is always the best way to go. Also, we're gonna be doing lots of grafting, so you can actually take tape and wrap around your fingers. And this can help prevent your fingers from getting cut. You know, it's always best to do that if you think it's necessary. And it's always better because an ounce of prevention is worth a pound to cure. Hey guys, I'm Matt, I'm here with Corbin. 
and we're talking a little bit about grafting. Corbett's got a lot of interest in learning about it, and he's new here at Mr. Maple, at least to the propagation side new. He's been doing a lot of our editing, so you saw a lot of his work already. But uh, we're talking a little bit about grafting, and we're going to get into a little bit of the tools, a little bit of what we do. Now, this is the tool everybody wants to use for grafting. This is one of those mechanical cut tools. And if it worked for Japanese maples, yes, it would make it easier. Unfortunately, these do not work for Japanese maples. They do work for fruit trees and things like that. So save your money if you're looking for this tool for Japanese maples. Uh, it's very hard to get an exact size scion and an exact size rootstock. So they have to be exactly the same size to marry up for this. And it works for trees that have smaller cambians or larger cambians that are easier to line up like fruit trees. But for Japanese maples, uh, you can skip this. Now, we typically use a Tina grafting knife. What we use here at our nursery are 605s and 606s. Uh, the 606 is the left-handed version. Now, this is a German grafting knife that has a bevel basically to one side, so it's flat on the one side. So we just sharpen one side of our knife. And you want a really good sharp knife. My knife actually isn't that sharp right now. Uh, my dad, all he ever did ever was use an X-Acto knife. He actually had like one of the rounded hobbyist forms but you know you can graft Japanese maples with something this simple that you just pick up at a, at a department store. The benefit of that is when the, the blade's not sharp, you just throw it out. But it certainly can be done that way. Now there's other forms of Tina's, uh, like this curved knife, uh, I believe it's a 607. Now this is very popular for grafting conifers, but it really doesn't do us too many favors with that, that curved knife on grafting Japanese maples. It's just gonna make things a little bit more difficult. Uh, a couple other tools we have, uh, concave trimmers. So we use these to kind of make clear, precise cuts. And another term you've learned earlier is our sawn wood. And we're gonna use this to graft onto our rootstock. And the next thing we've listed here is our grafting rubber bands. So we're gonna be using those to secure our sawn to our rootstock. So Corbin, let's go ahead and clean these trimmers. Uh, it's very important to, to be very clean when you're doing this and remember that you're making a small surgical procedure, you know, on a plant. So we tend to clean our pruners between cutting each set of sawn wood from the tree and then in between each set of grafts, we'll actually clean our grafting knife and our pruners. That's just so we don't spread bacteria throughout a set. And uh, you're basically gonna keep each individual set different. That way, if something does happen, it's easy to identify where it went wrong. Perfect, man, thanks. And these are just a basic small set of concave bonsai pruners. Uh, sometimes we use Joshua Roths. They're pretty expensive. You can sometimes find cheaper versions that do the same thing. Uh, but you know, it's nice to have those bonsai pruners to get real precise cuts. And they help a little bit with shrinking down our sign wood here. Now, another key step right here is we've already got our labels ready for these red dawns. It's very important at the point of grafting to be able to label your plants. Uh, a lot of nurseries will put one label for so many different things. And it's a dangerous thing. You're playing with fire there because uh, it's easy to get things mislabeled and you think with the best intentions, you're gonna go back and fix it. But oftentimes things don't. That's how they get mixed up in the trade. So we like to label every single plant at the point of production here. And that way we know going forward, we've got our Acer Shiro Solidum Red Dawn. So we're gonna cut down our sign wood just a little bit from these sizes. Uh, typically what you want is about two sets of terminal buds if it was like something super rare, like the first time we grafted like Dragon Master and we were wanting to get as many of them out of the signs as we could, we, 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 could go, we could go down to two sets of terminal buds, just one. So just having one set of terminal buds there. Uh, but typically, ideally, you'd get at least two there. Right. So whenever you're um, collecting sign, we talked a little bit about this in the earlier video, but you're looking for that healthy wood and you want to make sure that your buds aren't set yet and all the, these sort of things that you check out before that yeah. you actually start grafting. If they're too far along, it's not gonna take. So if they're active, if the rootstock and, and the scion, they have to be at the same stage. So if the scion is too far along, uh, you're just gonna get a fail because the, the, the buds wanna be, you know, slightly swollen is good. You wanna be able to notice healthy buds on there. If you have no buds, uh, it's no take. I've done it before, but it's really hard. I've had really rare chances at something with no buds, but you're basically praying that it reforms a bud on there. So you want to keep those buds super healthy. You don't want to damage them while you're while you're doing your grafting process. When I'm cutting my sign, I typically hold it 
so that I can keep those buds, you know, in a safe location. Like I'll actually, you know, hold it this way. And that actually helps me get my, uh, we do a modified side veneer graft here. So it actually helps me do that modified side veneer graft because I can flip the tree over and go 180 on the other side. And the tree's buds have actually helped me, you know, locate exactly where that's at. Right, and what, what are some of the benefits of using the modified side veneer over, say, some of the other kind of cuts? Because Oh, know. that's a great question. And again, if you have a million grafters, you get a million answers. We prefer a modified side veneer graft because it cleans up the best long term. Uh, I went to a garden show one time and we only had really big stuff. And they were like, I don't believe in this material is grafted. And I said, well, that's the best compliment you could pay us. That's exactly what we want it to look like. And uh, my dad started out doing modified side veneer grafts. Uh, basically, a modified side veneer graft has a wedge on either side. And so you have two chances for it to take. You can take on either side of the little pocket there. And we like it because once it cleans up, it is one of the most unnoticeable grafts. So it's going to be a nicer graft down the road. Yeah, that's definitely true. I've I kind of uh, put together that grafting is really a numbers game, right? Like you're trying to do all these little steps to make sure that you can get that highest output of graft. And it's really interesting because like you said, you have a thousand different answers from a thousand different grafters. So it really Everybody is does it a little different and it's kind of all about finding what works for you. Uh, you know, I took some things from my dad and Tim and I went and learned other methods from different propagators and we've used little pieces from everybody. Like my dad, he never, he never grafted with a grafting knife until after Tim and I took over the business. We bought him a left-handed Tina and he was like, oh, what do I do with this? And he actually loved it. But up until that point, uh, you know, for 25 years, he'd only grafted with like X-Acto knives. So it certainly could be done a ton of different ways. Yeah. So whenever I first started here, I didn't ever really uh, understand what a graft was or, I mean, obviously I knew what a seedling was. But it is really interesting to see, um, like locking in that genetic copy of yeah. the tree. And uh, that's something that I always think is interesting. I also enjoy the thought, it's like picking and choosing different root stocks mm. as well. Like that was something that interested me. Um, and it really is so cool because, I mean, I don't know if this is how you think about it, but you know, you're kind of uh, doing some Frankensteining, right. honestly. And uh, that's always cool. And it's like, how can you get the best tree to survive in the right. best locations? Well, it is that exactly. I mean, you're taking two plants and you're cloning them onto one root system. So you're taking everything you like about, you know, the cultivar, everything that's cool about Red Dawn and putting it on the best possible root system. So you are kind of making this Frankenstein's monster here between the two because, uh, you know, you're going to get that little graft union going on. And it really is the best way to replicate plants. There's a lot of misconceptions about grafting. Uh, it, it kills me. There's a lot of bad stuff on some of those groups too. You'll find Japanese maple groups and people will say, what's wrong with this tree? And they'll say, well, it's a bad graft. And they've, they've never grafted. There's tons of different styles of grafting. So modified side veneer grafts may be noticeable when they're young, but they, they definitely aren't as they age. It's one of the cleanest grafts. And there's lots of different styles of that. So like a tea bud or a chip bud graft are going to be more noticeable at long term, but they can still be a good graft. And as long as the graft is a take, it really doesn't matter that much toward the long-term health once it's healed over. Now it's going to matter a whole lot toward the take. If you've got a bad take, the tree's never going to leaf out to begin with. You know if it's a bad graft because the graft didn't take. Yeah, and something I also think is interesting too is with that side veneer graft, you know, you have that main leader from the original root stock, mm. but as it grows and uh, gets older, you slowly see that graft start to become the, uh, the, the lead uh, branch. And it's really interesting how that happens, honestly. Yeah, we're going to slowly reduce that root stock and that'll be in that last step, but we'll slowly reduce that down. And then all that'll be left will be the scion. So that'll be growing from there forward. Um, really simple though. And there's a lot of misconceptions too about, you know, why we graft. A lot of people think that a graft is a less desirable Japanese maple. And the truth of the matter is, if you're looking for a named variety, it's the best way to get a named variety of Japanese maple. If you have a, a, a rooted cutting of a named variety, it may not do as well long-term in the ground. And if you have one from seed, well, then you don't have a named variety, right? right. I mean, that's the whole thing. People think uh, a seedling from a blood good is a blood good, and it just isn't. The only way to get a true form is a, a grafted clone. Awesome, man. All right, so we're gonna cut some of our sawn wood down a little bit. This is that Red Dawn Tim was cutting earlier. And again, typically here, all I'm looking for is two sets of terminal buds. You know, sometimes if you have three, we'll just go ahead and leave three there. It's not like you have to cut that down to one or something. Uh, but what we're looking for is a nice little healthy 
flush of new growth from last year. Now, what I do when I'm making my cuts, I hold the buds like this. That way I'm not mashing the buds or putting pressure against uh, what's going on in here. And it just helps me not break those buds because I have to have healthy buds to get a good take. And so that helps me protect those just a little bit. Now, when I like to, when I make my graphs, I like to cut away from myself. I don't cut toward the body. You can actually cut this way as well. Like I've seen people do it uh, that, that aren't very good at this process, but you can put it on like a cutting block and do a lot quickly that way as well. So it's kind of a cheat for people uh, but also some people, it speeds them up. But the way I graft is I graft like this and I want to make a minimal motion this way. And then I'm going to rotate my graft and make a minimal motion this way. So you're really just going to let the knife do all the work. We're not really pulling hard. We're not snapping. And we want to make a clean cut so that we don't get a lot of dips in that part. Right. And so for this, you said you want to t take that and make a 180 degree turn so that yeah, you can I'll get the best cut. Yeah, I'll rotate that sign over completely like that. And that just helps me line things up. Okay. So I made a small wedge there, and I'm actually gonna come over here on the back side of this and make a slightly smaller cut like that. Oh, nice. So this is our basic small leaf wedge there that we've got going on in our sign. And next we'll talk a little bit about cutting our rootstock. Now, again, I don't like to cut toward myself. So I like, you know, safety first here. Um, I'll, to, I'll actually come in here at this point sometimes, go ahead and reduce my rootstock down a little bit. And we can make that shorter. Uh, typically, I leave the rootstock about as high as the scion. Sometimes a little bit higher just to protect it if I'm putting poly over it, but not a lot higher. Now, when we're doing this step, I like to line the tree up with me, you know, square to my body, square with the container, because we're, we're, cut, we're grafting into, uh, you know, little Anderson band pots here. Now, what I do is I look at these little shoots like this, and I'll come right below this little set of nodes, because it's actually going to dry back to that set. So we're grafting, if you go right below these little indentions, it almost looks like bamboo. You see those little, right. those little uh, compartmentalized sections. By grafting right below those, we know we can get a little good dry back right to that. So it'll kind of slow things down. Now, again, I put my hand above my rootstock and I make the knife do all the work. I don't cut toward my hands. I'll use my left hand because I'm right-handed to stabilize the rootstock. And then I'll make a slight wedge like this and I'll just let the knife do all the work right to left. So then I've got a little small pocket for us to put our sign wood into. Right, so you're just making two little pieces that slip right in together. Right, and then we're gonna take this and marry this up with this part and wrap it up with a rubber band. Nice. So the next step is lining up our cambians on both. Now you have to line up the cambian correctly to get a take. If you get no cambian alignment, it's not gonna take. And so the cambian is that little green part you see in the scion and also on the rootstock. So those two must kind of marry up a little bit. Now it's okay if it's all one side. In a perfect world, you get both sides to line up perfectly, but that's rare because oftentimes our uh, you know rootstock's a little bit smaller or, or a little bit larger than our, our sign. Now what I do is I use my thumb and I come in from the left with my left hand and I'll use that to help me align the two. Okay. And the last step here is to secure that to our tree with a rubber band. Right, and I know most of you, we, we mostly use rubber bands, but you can use other things like, um, there's like a tree glue almost like that. Yeah, we'll use that after the rubber bands a lot of times. Uh, some people will use this part to secure it with buddy tape. So there's like a wax tape, like a paraffin wax right. you can stretch around it to hold it in. Now it's a simple tool here. Basically all we're doing is tying a balloon. So it's like tying off the back of a balloon. I'll go up the tree like this, but then I'll actually go back down and tie it through at the bottom so that we're not creating a wedge at the top. And that's the basic concept behind our graph there. Interesting, it seems pretty simple, honestly. Yeah, I mean, it, it, seems, it seems easy. Uh, you know, on a really busy day, I could do about 400 of these if we're really pushing it. Uh, the next step will be that we come in here with some of our tree coat or paraffin wax and coat over uh, our liner. We'll often tip our sign here, but not our rootstock because we want to leave that up here as a sap stump to allow sap to bleed out the top. Right, because you don't want to push your graft off of the tree, right? Right, if we're closing off the rootstock, we're going to be pushing all the sap into the tree and so we want to allow this to bleed. As, it, as this leaves out, we're going to come and reduce the size of that sap stump. 
All right. We'll go ahead and reduce these down just a little for and being able to see you. You would reduce it down right yeah, there? Yeah, I'll put it about right there. That way we can see you real good too. Okay. And I can use a box cutter too. Whichever you prefer, you want a knife? Yeah, and I'll cut it at the front this time too. Yeah, you, I didn't tell you that, sorry. So what you wanna do, and we'll do it on camera here. So what you wanna do is go to the front and I'll use this just to kind of make my wedge and flip it and then just that way. Okay. So right about there is probably good. Perfect. Dang, all right. Yeah, it's often important if you if you uh, if you undercut or if you don't like the first cut to start over all the way behind it. Okay. That way you're not making more dips into it. Yeah, definitely gonna need some practice on this for sure. <laughs> it takes a little bit of time to master it, but once you got it down pat, it's it's pretty easy. And believe it or not, you could get some takes on that. That has a little bit of a pit to it, but you can right. get some takes that way still. Okay, well, let's try it out then. Starting right here. Just go a little lower. Go to the next node down right okay. here. Okay. Yeah, that's the best way to do it. Starting at the tip right here. Yep. Try to keep your angle as high up as you can, so you're not making it like this, but you're making it more like this. Okay. Could be a little harder with that one just because there's uh, you know, some room on that, that knife, but... That's a great cut. Yeah, that's a great cut right there. Perfect. Right. I think that's really good. Nice. All right, now let's take our scion, and we're going to put that in our thumb. Uh, again, I try to, I bring in the uh, scion on my left hand because I'm right-handed, and I use my thumbnail to kind of line those cambians up. When you put that together, you don't want to see any light between it. All right. And we're going to look where that cambium is, and we're just going to make all that green disappear with that flap. And we're going to get to a stage that looks kind of like that. All right. I think... Looks pretty good there. All right. All right, and should we wrap it up with the rubber band? Yeah, let's let's put those around. So I'll use uh, you know my finger or my thumb to kind of hold that in place. And what I do with my rubber band is I get one wrap around the base like this, and then I still got to make sure all that alignment's going on there. Right, because you don't want to shift yeah, it if off. Seeing, if you're seeing uh, the green, it, it's shifted too much. And then I go up, and then once I get up here, I'll go back down around it again down, and tie it off down here. Alrighty. Hold it like that with my index finger, and I'll go up. And then when I'm coming back down, I don't have to pull anything out here. I just use this and oh, then okay. tuck under like that. So as I let go of it, I just use that back into itself like that. So that way it's uh, a little bit quicker to tie. Nice. Well. Not perfect, but I guess it'll do. Hopefully, hey, it's got a shot. Yeah, hopefully we get to come back and have a little update video. And hey, maybe this thing will be alive, maybe not. <laughs> hopefully I'll have a little bit more practice by then too, so. Very cool. Guys, thanks for watching our Grafton series. Now this was B, so this was part two to our whole series. We've done a whole series of these, so you'll have to stay tuned for part three, which will actually be the C with the post care and how to have your a good success with grafting. Part A, we talk a little bit about the pre-care. Definitely go check that one out if you haven't yet. But I think it's going to give you some confidence and hopefully help you a little bit with your grafting process. Yeah, man, I, I really do appreciate you teaching me this. Um, I've been wanting to go out and find some of those wild specimens of certain trees and bring them back and start cultivating because uh, I think it is such a cool thing to be able to clone a tree. And uh, I know most of you guys are active in that live chat and that comment section. Don't tear me up too much. This is my first time. So. Hey, I thought you did really good for your first time. So a lot of people at home are probably learning for their first time too. And so I think uh, I think they can sympathize with you and you made a, you know, a great uh, person for people to learn with. So I think you're going to enjoy this and your enthusiasm is going to, it's going to come through and make it easy. The whole thing is just continuing to try. Uh, you're going to fail several times. The first time we did this, Tim and I failed miserably. Like we did 10,000 graphs and we've got 700 to take. 
and then we went and learned how to do this better. So hopefully this grafting series uh, shows you a little bit about what we do. If, guys, if you like propagation videos and grafting and rooted cutting videos, we're giving it away for free here at Mr. Maple. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's a great way to learn a lot about Japanese maples. We do seven days a week content, so we're basically giving away a Japanese maple book for free in video format every single week. There's always something new happening. And so if you appreciate grafting, definitely hit that like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Take care. God bless. And have a great day.